Hey everyone, welcome to Bible Discoveries, the weekend show. On this show, we answer your questions. Uh, Bible Discovery is going through the Bible this year and the weekend show, we take a look at the entire week's reading from Monday to Sunday. That's where we try to hang out. That's where we try to stay. And we pop in viewer comments and viewer questions as a discussion starter between me, who, if this is your first time here, I'm Corey, and my husband, Matlock. Hey, Matlock. What's going on? Well, prophets, right? That's We're right. the prophets. One prophet specifically. Which one? Jeremiah 26 to 48. Yes. So if you've been following along, reading the Bible in a year, this week's reading is Jeremiah 26 to 48. And uh, it's always really interesting. Jeremiah is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's a lot of parallels and prophecies that are related to the New Testament here, mm -hmm. uh, Jeremiah 30 specifically. But we, regardless of Jeremiah, I guess the actual Bible reading itself. We have four questions related to Jeremiah. We do, we yes. do. How about I ask you the first one? Yeah? Yes. Okay, sure. Okay. Let's do it. The first one All comes right. from Jeremiah 28 to 29. Uh, and this is the question. Is it demons and devils speaking through false prophets or do false prophets speak from their own imaginations and desires? Okay. It's a good question. It is. And it is both. It's a both and. I definitely agree with you. Yes. yes, it's both. Okay, so let's read. Okay, so for one, let's go to Jeremiah 23, which is, this is the uh, more of like the more renowned or famous one. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 16 to 24 is the whole thing. I'll just read starting at 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouths of the not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you, and to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, No disaster shall come upon you. Okay, sounds like today, eh? Holy smokes. Anyways, um the point here is that uh Jeremiah says in verse 16 that they're following their own minds, their own delusions. Now we know elsewhere that, like let's say the prophet of Tyre and Ezekiel. Right, Ezekiel is prophesying about the king of Tyre, prophet Tyre. To, he's prophesying to the king of Tyre. And he starts talking about the devil and this demons behind them, beh behind yep. the king. Um, so when false prophets speak, it's in part their own desires, but also in part demonic whispers or devilish desires or whatever it is. Um, and so sometimes, I think that's what I'm saying, it's a, it's a both and. Uh, are they always inspired by demonic forces to say that? Well, on a fundamental sense, yes, but not necessarily every single thing that they say is demonically inspired. Sometimes it's just them desiring something and their desires are twisted and depraved. Um, and then over time, because we're in a spiritual warfare right, in the New Testament, over time, um, these delusions and these desires get more and more twisted and more and more devilish or demonic, you could say. And it's because when you are against God, you've essentially allowed a gateway for those dark spiritual forces to enter your life. Um, and whether or not that gateway, whether or not it's conscience or intentional, it doesn't really matter. You've gone against God, so now the, the opposite of that is allowed to permeate and allowed to live within. Um, now, there are, even though... Um, there are some false prophets and some people who don't, let's say people who aren't false, people who just don't believe in God. They uh, are just like, you know, let's say an atheist who just rejects God. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a false prophet, right? It's not the same thing. Um, they just allowed a gateway. So there is a, like a natural moral resistance that God has given you being made in the image of God against those things. So you might, you know, not all atheists are like murderers and liars and false teachers. It doesn't work that way. Um, uh, but the more and more you reject goodness, the more and more you fall down that trap and the more and more that gateway becomes bigger for more and more darkness to enter your life. That's the idea. Um, so anyways, but long story short is that the darker your life becomes, the more territory you give over to demonic forces so that uh, it becomes more obvious that demons are working through uh, to those who are in good standing with the Lord. Um, that's kind of haphazard. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Definitely, right. I think I think that there's like we have to make some distinctions when it comes to 
to what the Bible specifically says about uh, prophets, which I mean, I would I would call a false prophet someone who claims to be speaking for the God of the Bible, for the yes. the God who created the heavens and the earth, for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Jesus Christ, yes. right? Like that is what I would say. A, a false prophet is someone who claims to be speaking for God, but is not speaking for God, right. is listening to their own dreams and desires and or listening to a different spirit other than the spirit of God. There are prophets outside of Christianity, outside of the true worship of God. There are pagan prophets that also receive prophecies. They are not hearing from God, they're hearing from something else. And I think that it would be classified the same, whereas sometimes it's their own dreams and imaginations and intuitions and their ability yeah. to sense the world around them. And at other times, it's actually coming from a spiritual force. I mean, we think about even Balaam in Numbers chapter 22, who for all uh, accounts was a pagan prophet, and yet he still did hear from God sometimes. It doesn't make him a prophet of God. It makes him a prophet that sometimes heard from the real God and was not stupid enough to not realize it. He knew when he was hearing from um, right. from an actual spirit or, uh, or God. Which is scarier. Much scarier. Yeah. Uh, but like, consider also First Kings chapter 21, where we've got uh, prophets in the court of King Ahab who uh, are, are not prophets of God. And yet, and yet, a prophet of God says that, let me see you here. Um, Micaiah, a true prophet of God, comes in and he speaks to Ahab. And this is part of what he says in First Kings 22, verse 21. Um, he's saying that a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. So what this tells us <laughs> is that there is a very active spiritual world of which we know very little. So we have to be careful when we're when we're listening to prophecies, we have to be careful that we pray about these prophecies, that we get uh, people who are experienced in this to evaluate these prophecies a la Corinthians, okay? I mean, you think about, it makes me think about Galatians 1 verse 8, where Paul is, is chastising the Galatians for uh, veering away from the gospels. And he's like, it, it, from the gospel, excuse me, of Jesus Christ, and, and he says, if, if even if I or an angel from heaven stood before you and told you a different gospel, you should reject it. So we have like this standard and, and even Paul is saying it is at least hypothetically possible that you will be visited by some sort right. of angelic creature who tells you something that is wrong. Uh, so yes. there is a spiritual world that's going on. We know from Jeremiah that Again, sometimes prophets are speaking from their own vain imaginations or dreams that they're having right. that they're putting too much stock into. But we know on the flip side, God can and does speak in dreams and in visions and audibly to people and uh, in in impressions as well. Uh, so we have this is a this is a this is a, a a place that requires discernment and care rather than just a haphazard caution to the wind kind right. of. Yes, I agree. So to add to this, so the reason why I brought up atheists because false prophets are inherently worse than atheists. Like inherently because right. one is just simply, let's say, emotionally rejecting God. Just doesn't like the idea right. of God. And they're just uncomfortable with it. Bible just says that the people who are like that are just foolish. But then one is deliberately acting as though it is God. One is just saying, I don't want anything to do with this. The other one's saying, no, I want to pretend to be a prophet of God and deceive people. Now, there's two strains of this which we have to be concerned about. One, someone who's intentional about it, who's mm -hmm. intentionally deceiving and knows the voice of the Lord, but still is doing its own thing. That's worse than someone who's unintentionally doing it. Like, oh, I was taught to, like, this is how life works. Exactly. So, so it's a lot like a, a false teacher versus a teacher who is mistaken. That's right. And by the same time, those intentions don't justify you as in the right at all. Mm -hmm. You're still in the wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So inherently, um, inherently, people have a will, and that precedes their intentions. And their will isn't properly um, refined or sanctified yet in the Lord. That's why. So then you've been taught because you've been taught. Let's say someone who's doing it unintentionally taught to do evil things. You don't yet see because your heart's been taught to be hardened. You don't yet see what it's like to have a heart. Uh, uh, know what it means to have like a heart of flesh, heart that's been refined by God. So that's what I'm saying. So if there's something that's just worse. So intentions do. And your, your level of knowledge does determine whether or not you're more responsible and more culpable before the Lord. Um, so that's important in this discussion. But at the same time, intends, uh, intentions aren't the bare bones. Like I think a lot of the times in our evangelical circles, we make intentions like so important. Like the, the really, really important, like our choice is so, so, so important. Choices are important. At the same time, we think about, uh, this is sort of related, but uh, Jacob's prophecy to his sons. Um uh, uh, Isaac's prophecy to his sons, Jacob and Esau, excuse me. Mm-hmm. And when he blesses Isaac, right? Uh, when he t- intends to blend Isaac, he actually bl- uh, blesses Jacob. Uh, Jacob's, uh, yeah, sorry. He, he, Isaac then, thank you. When Isaac <laughs> blesses Jacob, but he meant to, uh, he intended to bless Esau, but he didn't know, right? But he accidentally blessed Jacob and said, Got it all messed up. You got Anyways, it there. You, you got, got it there. You got Anyways, it. Anyways, <laughs> it's the blessing still ha- had to happen, and there's nothing that Isaac could do. So, despite Isaac's intentions, yeah. it didn't matter. Right. That's what I'm saying. So, something inherently is more dominant than our intentions. That's really important. The Spirit of God and the way the Spirit moves is more, in, is, it supersedes our intentions. And that's important in this discussion. Here's where I would offer a little bit of pushback, though. Sure. Not not a full out disagreement, but a little bit of pushback. When you look at the difference between in the in the New Testament, when you look at the difference between a false teacher and a teacher who's mistaken, there is a big difference. Where a false teacher is meaning to mix truth with lies and lead people away yes. from from the true God and get them worshiping a worshiping a false version of God for their own. Uh, benefit. So like for money, for example, uh, uh, you know, for their own prosperity and the, and they're willing to lie to you and they're willing to lead you astray yes. and they don't care whether you go to heaven or hell. That's a lot different than someone who is mistaken, for example, about, about um, you know, something that Paul says right. in the New Testament and, and they, and they, they, pr- maybe they preach it wrong and then they're corrected. Uh, Right and and correct that that there is there is a distinction there between one is leading you away from the gospel and one is yes. not. Yes. Okay, but right, but but that's not really pushback because that doesn't go against what I'm saying. Because I, I agree but with that. But intention there does it. matter. No, when that's and that's I'm, that's I'm the not, part that's the portion where I'm pushing back where you're no, like intention. I've already, is, I've already said attention does matter in terms of consequence and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, but I think it also matters in terms of spiritual empowerment. Right, I I do believe in a very active spiritual world. I think the Bible shows us a worldview that's really spiritual. So I think when someone is all in trying to get someone away from the gospel, yes. they can be spiritually empowered uh, by right, evil. But- Whereas I don't think when you have when you have a spirit filled Christian, I don't think that their words can be used in the same way by evil. Yes, but I'm because not, God is protecting them. I'm not them. addressing the extremes. Because you're addressing, you, you brought up two extremes. Of course, I don't really think it's extreme. You know what I'm saying is, you brought up the guy who's a complete false prophet, which I agree with, right? Yeah. Who's intentionally going against God, and the guy who's intentionally looking after Christ and doing things right and willing to repent when he's corrected. Those are the extremes. I'm talking about the gray ground, the gray ground. Where despite your intentions, you're still in the wrong. Despite what you intend, despite oh, I mean to do well, because that's what he, he's saying. Oh. God bless you and protect you. Even in Jeremiah 23, we just read that he's saying he's prophesying peace over this. He means well. But he's, it's his own heart and desire still. So someone who was taught that oh, is still I, in the wrong, despite their intentions that might align with the biblical values of, of peace and prosperity, let's say. No, it's but see, I, the intentions still coming from a wrong place. So despite your intentions, right. intention isn't the dominant superseding force here. That's the only reason I highlight that. So that's a gray area because you have the extremes, then you have the areas that's in between of people who are being molded and pushed and pulled into different directions and they're sort of sometimes they're being willing to take correction sometimes they're like no no no, no. 
Like, Here's and, what, and they go down different avenues. Right, but I don't think Jeremiah 28 and 29 is an example of the gray area at all because Hananiah has to go against the prophet Jeremiah, the prophetess Huldah, okay, right. and other prophets, the prophet Ezekiel, yes. who's all prophesying the same thing. They're all prophesying that Babylon is going to come and destroy Jer- Jerusalem. And yes. Hananiah is like, no, uh, Sorry, l- let me rephrase you know I mean? that. I'm not saying that that is, that that is an example of a gray area because oh, they're willfully okay. rejecting. I'm saying... I'm saying that there is a gray area that uses the same aspects of those extreme areas, like okay. you speaking out of your mind. Because people speak from their own desires, which are inherently depraved mm-hmm. and of sin, mm-hmm. if they're taught that that's how prophecy works, if they're taught that, right, they're going right. to continuously do that. And they're going to continuously right. be in the I wrong saying, despite yeah. their intentions. Yes. Oh, I mean good. But right. they've been taught that good is evil, evil is good their whole lives. Right. So despite their intentions, right? Even though they might think that they're doing something right, it's not right still. Right. That's what I'm getting at. But there's are obviously more extreme cases when then people who are who are like that who don't know that they're doing wrong, but they're doing wrong because they haven't been engaged by the living God in a real way or seen a real prophet or anything like that. What I'm saying is there's inherently a gray area because of people who have been taught to live that way, but have mm-hmm. not been instructed or corrected and but may, perhaps are willing to. So anyways, but here's what I'm saying. They will be eventually. And that's what I'm saying. Yes. Because, because like if your heart is actually searching for God, God will yes. confront you. Absolutely. With truth. So, so like, that's like a, that's a temporary space it, because once they're confronted then with the truth of God, they will absolutely. choose. And it Neutrality will like, is inherently neutral. It's waiting to be morphed into that one, one or temporary, the other. Temporary, yeah. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I understand what you're saying. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Now, so yes. there's just that, there's that one area. <laughs> And so that's the reason why you see in the New Testament when Christ is like, woe to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? And he goes, woe to the, the, uh, to the Pharisees uh, and the experts of the law, whoever they were, who go out across the sea and make proselytes of those and make them half as, uh, twice as wicked for hell as themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, what he's saying is these, these guys are going out and teaching them to be more evil than themselves and they're just listening to it. Now, is it possible these people, some of these guys repent and get out? Yeah, of course. Right, that's what we're hoping for. But there are also some people who aren't. But there's that gray area of people who are still raising up, who haven't firmed either way. Mm-hmm. People on the fence. It's mm-hmm. There's always those fence guys. Well, it's like Until Apollos, the great day of right? Judgment. It's like Apollos in Acts where he meets Priscilla and Aquila, and Priscilla and Aquila take him aside, and they're like, "Okay, here's here's the whole gospel," and he's like, "Oh, yes." Oh, and then right. he becomes like a great right. preacher That's right. in, in the early church. That's right. But like he would have been in that gray area. It's not, not like he's teaching things that are wrong. Right. But he's not teaching the full truth That's yet. And right. then God confronts him with the full truth and he is he's more than it. happy That's to right. accept so, it. So, so inherently yeah. you have, exactly. Yeah. So there's always that gray area. So maybe perhaps he's like a light gray as opposed to like a dark gray. You see what I'm <laughs> oh, goodness. Anyways, anyways, but, <laughs> but Classification. Yeah, but that is only temporal. Like you're saying, because great day of judgment, you see God separates the sheep from the goats, the light from the dark. And it is a clean contrast cut between the two, right? Um, but right now we're in this time where our ability to per- uh, perceive things and our discernment uh, is obviously incomplete, but is also contingent upon the Holy Spirit uh, to properly discern things. And even at times we'll fall into weakness, uh, right? And not properly listen to the Lord. So it, it's obviously like, that's the way it is. Anyways, I'm glad we had to clear it up. <laughs> Me too. Corey, next, Me too. next question. Jeremiah yeah. 30. Okay. Okay. Is the time of Jacob's trouble now? You're just throwing me under the bus, asking me eschatological questions. It's just, no problem. Okay, go ahead. Is it now? <laughs> let's, let's go uh, no, 30. I don't. Okay. No, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think we are currently in the time of Jacob's trouble according to Jeremiah chapter 30. 30. Right. Uh, but in order to kind of explain why I don't think so, we have to talk about the concept of the day of the Lord. But let's uh, first look at where this phrase, the time of Jacob trouble, Jacob's trouble or the day of Jacob's trouble is coming from. So. All right. Do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it? What? Either. I'm just deciding where we should start reading from. Okay. Um. Okay, I'll just read, I'll read a four to seven. Okay. Jeremiah 30, verse four to seven. These are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. So northern Israel, southern Judah, which is interesting because at this time in Judah's history, there is no northern Israel at that point. Thus says the Lord, 
We have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. Now, of course, to really get the full context, you should read the entirety of Jeremiah chapter 30, but that's where we're going to stop for now. So um, this is talking about a, a day of judgment, a, a day of a day of trouble, okay, or distress for Jacob that God will stop and save them out of and bring the nations that have wrought this panic and this trouble on Israel and Jacob, Israel and Judah, excuse me, uh, Jacob refers to both of them because they're all descendants of Jacob, but Northern Israel and Southern Judah, that there have been nations who have wrought this terror on them and God will bring into judgment those nations and rescue Jacob, so Northern Israel and Southern Judah out of it. Now, when you look at this concept of judgment, this day of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord always refers to God bringing into judgment nations. Sometimes it's Northern Israel. Sometimes it's Southern Judah. Sometimes it's Edom. Sometimes it's Egypt. Sometimes it's Moab. Sometimes it's the whole world. And ultimately there's like all these, I don't want to say mini days of the Lord because that sounds like I'm downplaying it, but essentially there's all of these smaller versions of the day of the Lord where God is bringing judgment. And then there's an ultimate day of the Lord where God brings the entire world into judgment. So depending on like your eschatological views, so your view of the end times, a lot of people will line up this time of Jacob's trouble with um, the with a with the concept of the seven year revelation that uh, um, tribulation that we see in Revelation, um, and this final battle uh, against Israel by the nations that God rescues them out of, uh, and and I I think there's a lot of validity to that, um, but it's definitely worth you doing your own um, study on the day of the Lord because I think it's really 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 interesting. We know that the day of the Lord is something that is terrifying in and of itself. I mean, if you jump over to Amos 5, uh, Amos 5 verse 18 says, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. And, and Amos is speaking to people who are living in rebellion against God and living in rebellion against sin. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different prophets that talk about Smaller versions of the day of the Lord always meaning God bringing judgment on a nation or a people. And then the larger day of the Lord, which is um, God bringing into judgment all the nations. Right. So I think, I think going back to is today the time of Jacob's trouble. I think that there is a similar instance where you can point to historical moments where you're like, wow, that looks like essentially a, like a, a mini, a smaller version of the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, I, you can look at the besiegement of Samaria, the besiegement of Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Of course, the Holocaust is terrible. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and even now, some people would point to the war going on in Israel and be like, this is really interesting because Israel is there and there's all these nations surrounding her that are trying to destroy her. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I agree. So like, I, inherently, so if, when you look at Israel, so what is Israel? Israel is a typological church. In other words, so many things in the New Testament are foreshadowing or as shadows of the New Testament, which is more substance. Mm -hmm. Israel is a local church congregation, whereas the church is the global church. So as the earth is, is God's footstool, Israel was the footstool, but just one piece of it. So God, now the church is the global. It's the whole globe. God is going for He's sending out his army in spiritual warfare to take over the world, quote unquote, which is, you know, through peace and love. <laughs> oh, oh, terrible thing. No, lovely things. So anyways, the point is, is that um, Israel is a typological church. So with that in mind, the things that happen to Israel are used for our instruction and our benefit uh, to know that are sim are, are going to be similar to, as foreshadows, of the things to come. So in a sense, yeah, you're right. It's like, it's if you look at time like a spiral, it's like, okay, well, this, this is what happened to Israel. And at this point, it's like, okay, what's going to happen again? Like, as history repeats itself, um, you know, not, it's not exactly the same, but in a similar way, you know, just the, it's the same. Anyways, it's 
going to come again in a similar way as God is the great author of life. And so these then become examples for us for the things to come. So yeah, I, I, I just agree with you. I think that um, time of Jacob's trouble was then as in Jacob's time. And then there's going to be like a, another version of it to come. Yeah. And I don't even think it, 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 fully, it didn't, it didn't happen in Jeremiah's time be, it completely. Uh, because when you read the rest of Jeremiah chapter 30, it talks about God bringing Northern Israel and Southern Judah back and them serving him without right. like with, with, with no barriers in between that they would approach the presence of God and God will be with them and things like that. And that, and that is, is where, that is where yes. it kind of falls apart. Right, right, right. Um, where you're like, okay, there, there was an exile. There was that terrible time of trouble. And then there was an exile and they did come back, but it wasn't, it, it, time kept going and right. there was a fall away again. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So there isn't like this final reunification of God and his people right. that we seem to see in right. the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right, which about. is supposed to happen. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Tori, Jeremiah 31. Next yes. question. Sure. What does the Bible mean when it says, the fathers have eaten sour grapes? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is Jeremiah chapter 31. Yes. Verse 29. Verse 29. In those days, they shall no longer say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Uh, verse 30. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. And then when you keep reading in Jeremiah chapter 31, really importantly, Jeremiah goes on then to describe the new covenant. Literally the next verse says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. Um, and so we see God promising to, to arbitrate this new covenant where the law is going to be inside of their hearts, written on the inside of them, as opposed to a set of laws that's outside that they have to conform to. Um, so the statement itself is really simple. The proverb, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and yet the children's teeth are set on edge. It's a cool proverb. Like if my dad were to eat something sour, I, even though I haven't eaten, I'm like, ooh. Right. I taste the sour, not my dad. And so this concept was, this proverb was popular in Israel and Judah because like us today, we are living in a political and physical scenario that our parents passed on to us. We didn't make the decisions that made our laws. You know, as you grow, you grow up in a culture, you grow up in a system of laws, even more so for Israel and Judah because of their covenant with God. Their very existence as a nation, them having a place in the land where they were, was dependent on their covenant with God, right? Um, and I mean, when you look at Genesis 22 and the covenant that God made with Abraham, it depended more on God than them, which is crazy and we can get into that later but they knew that they were especially in jeremiah's time they're like yeah we're going to be exiled but there's nothing we can do about it we're being exiled for the sins of our fathers not for our own sins though jeremiah seems to have argued that if they had repented it would have been a lot different <laughs> Nevertheless, so yeah, that's what the proverb means, right. is that my father has made a decision and I'm bearing the consequence for right. it. So God's saying, yep, like you are going to be punished for this, your own sin and your father's sin included, but there's a time coming when there's going to be a new covenant and the 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 children are, are, are going to eat their own sour grape. If you eat a sour grape, you're going to have puckered lips, not if your father eats a sour grape. So yes. the, the consequences move to a more personal yes. a thing rather than a corporate decision. So yeah. we see old covenant, corporate decision, new covenant, more of a personal decision. And that's really interesting because I know there's a lot of, uh, this is where... There, there are extremes here. Like if you take, let's say, individualism and communism, obviously there's an extreme with one in hand, one inherently puts the collective ahead of everything else. And the other one puts just the individual ahead of everything else. Right. And there's clearly a balance. I was like, no, what God is saying here is that he's not going to judge the people, mm -hmm. right, in the same way. Whereas like if your father does this, I'm not going to destroy your kids. Yeah. Right? Because because of something you did. That, that, yeah. not, not necessarily. Um and so that's that's really important. It's like there there's still like that middle ground there that's still happening, but it's uh, 
uh, much more in, in tune with uh, with what God desires for His people. Yeah. Anyways. Well, and and um, like what's what's really interesting about that is that it was still true in the time period of Jeremiah that God was dealing with people's faith on an individual level. Yes. Because otherwise Jeremiah and Baruch and Ebed Melech wouldn't exist. I formed so there was, you in the womb. Yes. Yeah. There was a remnant of people who chose to follow God, chose to accept God's correction, chose to follow him. And as a result, God's like, guess what? You're going to live. Right. Like you have to go through this, this punishment, th this corporate punishment for your nation, but you're going to live. Right. Uh, because you love me and you're following me and I'm going to be with you, Jeremiah, right. and I'm going to be with you, Baruch. Like we see these very personal chapters that God writes to Jeremiah and Baruch. Right. Um, so we see that he is dealing with people's faith on an individual level, but in terms of the covenant that he had, the covenant that he had forged with the Israelites uh, after the Exodus at Mount Sinai was like this land grant covenant. And it was success based on their obedience to the law of God. And so you could rightly say then, well, the land is suffering because my, of my father's decisions. And now I have to, I'm set in a path of their decisions. Right. And that was true in a certain way. But then what, right before he talks about what the new covenant is going to look like, that is stripped away. Right. Where it's all then on that individual basis. Right. And which is really which, interesting. And individual repentance. And that's yes. what's key. It was, you had to go to the, it was a whole corporate exercise. You had to go there, right? The high priest made a, a sacrifice. It was a whole like uh, collective exercise. And because of that, um, it wasn't the same thing. Like people did repent towards God in their heart, Absolutely. right? And that was obviously always happening and always ought to have been the case, mm -hmm. but that is no longer a mandatory case right? as it is, right? So it's different. I know we had that question uh, a while back about should we corporately repent mm -hmm. and these different things, okay? And there's value to that. Yeah, there's but still community. There's still community. And right? the body of Christ. But at the same time, we're not contingent upon that. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the, you know, anyways, that's a different discussion. It but. is. Let's move on. I think yeah? we should move on. To the last question? I think so. Okay. Okay, Matt, look, I'm going to ask it to you. Who is the queen of heaven that is talked about in Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah 44? And is there a queen of heaven right now? Yeah, supercharged question. Um, it is. Okay, so Jeremiah 7, 18. Let's just read them just for the sake of doing it. Jeremiah 7, 18. I'm getting there. Just take me some time. <laughs> do you want me to read it? You I there? have it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Read 718. Let's do it. I'll, okay. I'll read 44. Go ahead. Do you not see what they're doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. So this is a statement about the evil that's being go that's going on in Judah. Right. So I'm going to read now uh, chapter 44, verse 17 into 25, but I think I'll just stick with 17. But we will do everything that we have vowed, make offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her, as we did, both we and our fathers, our kings and our officials in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and prospered and saw no disaster. But since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And the woman said, when we made offerings to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, was it without our husband's approval that we made cakes for her, baking her image and poured out drink offerings to her? Then Jeremiah said to the people, men and women, all people, he had given him this answer. As for the offerings that you offer to the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your officials, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? Did it not come into his mind? The Lord could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. Therefore, your land has become a desolation and a waste and a curse within, in, without inhabitant as it is this day. It is because you made offerings and because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey the voice of the Lord or walk in his law and in his statutes and in his testimonies that this disaster has, has happened to you as at this day. Jeremiah said, to all the people and all the women, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who are in the land of Egypt. So very clearly, this is not a good thing. No. <laughs> no, no, it's very clear. This is not a good thing. Uh, so people have identified 
the Queen of Heaven as Ashira, absolutely, and Ashtoreth. Um, and any others that? I- yeah, she the, like depending on the culture that you're in, she had right. different like cultural names. But Ashira, Asherim is the plural. Right. Um, Ashtoreth. Right. She's the at different times. She's the consort of Baal. She's the consort of El. Um, so she she was responsible for provision. Right. Um, provision of the land, provision in your physical life, right. things like not that. Not the supreme god, but like a demigod. Not a, even a demigod. She was, but like, she was up there. She, she was, was up like there. right up there That's beside Baal and El. That's like, what I'm right. like, There's the supreme yeah. god and it's like right next underneath. I yeah. don't even know. Like it depends. It depends yeah. on like the time of history because they worship them together. Right? right. So like you can't be like, oh, I'll worship Baal, but not. Ashira or a sh- or a, like that's not going to work. Like you no, have right. to appease them both. So like in no, our course. in our monotheistic minds, we're like, well, there has to be like the top guy. No, I'm talking about in power, not necessarily in terms of worship. It, they're responsible for different things, right? So they have power over different things. Yes, polytheism. So it depends it, on right. what is most important to you, right? But usually, there's like Zeus is more powerful than the other gods. Like he wins by triumph, right? But, right. but like but if you, case, but like, know. but like if you needed healing. Right. Offering to Zeus isn't going to help you at all. No, of course not. In like not. that mindset. No, of course. So it depends right, right. on what you No, but there's still want in a lot of these the myth, uh, polytheistic mythologies. Yeah. You still have a hierarchy mm-hmm. where one god is is the supreme god. Definitely. But not yeah. actually, maybe supreme was the wrong word. It's the like the so, most powerful god. So uh, yes. Right, right. Yes. But it was also territorial. So right. certain gods had more authority in the ancient mindset. Certain gods had more authority over certain areas of land. Right. Right. So that was the most important God of that region because yes. they had the authority over that land. Yes. So we see Baal and Ashtoreth being celebrated, but we also see, for example, like the sun God being worshipped in Jerusalem, but not quite. It doesn't seem as as prolific as for this queen of heaven. Yes. Because of what she was supposedly responsible, especially for. in their area. And and also um, it was convenient to worship the queen of heaven because you could worship her alongside of the God of the Bible. So they thought, so there was this syncretic practice that was going on where they're like, well, Yahweh can be Baal. Right. And then Ashtoreth can be like his consort. Right. So it's like, we can still worship well, him, okay. but we will also worship her. Right. And it was like these syncretic practices that were really icky okay. that were I, going on. Right. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm kind of tying here. Yeah. So there's the actual practice that, happens in the actual cultures mm-hmm. and that's how that's how people adopt and synchronize yes it to their own culture yes okay so anyway so we the, the point is that we worship the lord only and that's that's yeah that is very clear that right yes oh, okay. that's so, what they should have been doing okay so now here we have then we come to this question and is there a queen of heaven now so in scripture there's no indication that there's a queen of heaven and she except, and, yeah right. and she wasn't actually the queen of heaven that's just what they that's called her, title. her that's exactly right like she wasn't legitimately right god's consort that wasn't well, a thing they're right. being chastised for doing this so so if when we come to this question because i know this is a loaded question because catholics have mary as the queen of the universe queen of heaven these different things right um right here's what i will say typologically so let's break this down okay uh we, the church, are the bride of Christ, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Christ is king, right? When the, when the, right? Christ is king. When the marriage consummation happens, okay, the, 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 the final day, the marriage supper of the lamb is supposed to be, right, typologically speaking, the, the church is a queen. Now, right, the two become one flesh. It's all related there. Now, this is all typology. This is all symbology. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is a symbol. So does that mean that, like, we're somehow gonna right, we wear a royal crown. It's like I don't know exactly what that looks like per se, but the typology is is that Christ is king, right? We're the bride of Christ, and that we're going into the marriage of the land, right? To be yeah. to be of one flesh. It's this great mystery of the church. Okay. Anyways, despite that mystery, so you have this relationship with Christ is also Adam. But then you also have this relationship where the church is also like Eve. Okay, so you have that the church is like Eve, the church and uh, Christ is like Adam. But also, there's this also type of large relationship you have where Mary is like Eve. Mary is like the second Eve. There's, there's, I can see the parallels there as well. Anyways, the point to be made is is that there are these parallels here. Do you see what I'm saying here? You seem you seem concerned. I, no, I'm just concerned about the Eve reference. It's just weird. What's yeah. what's weird? <laughs> Jesus is the second Adam. I don't think that he, that his mother is the second Eve. I think that's a weird. 
Oh, I, I just mean in the parallel. I know it's a teaching, but I find it weird. Okay, okay? Well, they're no, not. I'm, saying, but, I'm, saying, I'm just saying all the typologies. It's a yes. There's, yeah. there's, over, there's overlapping it's typologies. It's the, the acceptance versus the rejection. I get it. I get it. But yeah, like we're it's a lot of crossing symbolisms and crossing metaphors right now, where it's like well, the whole th- you could describe you could describe something in a multiple of different ways, which is what you're doing. Yes, I'm just yeah. I'm just over, overlapping the typologies that uh-huh. are set essentially. So Mary is often described as the second Eve, right? She uh, she bore uh, Christ within her, right, and the, the incarnate Christ, and uh, and uh, she bore God within her. Anyways, and so that became that is she is a symbol then, in a sense, of the church. So that's what she represents, especially in Catholic uh, theology. Yes. Anyways, so so you have that overlapping typology there. That's all it is. Um, how is she Queen of Heaven right now? Like I personally, this is above my pay grade. So I would say I, I it's don't above know all of our pay okay, grades. Okay, right. So to be I honest. personally do not know. Okay, if there's a quote unquote queen of heaven, all the typology suggests that they're like it's typological, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actual. And so that's what's important. Um, so, anyways, those are just the typologies that are presented in the text. Right. One day, the church, all those the true faithful those of Christ will become, right? It's also called sons and daughters. We're called the bride of Christ, but we're also called sons and daughters, right? So I'm saying it's all overlapping typologies. You can't be like, oh, one for one. This is this is actually the case. And you can't be actually a son and actually a bride. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So do you understand? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So the typologies well, because it's, be- it's because the typologies are for different reasons. Well, so we're yes. all sons of God, meaning that we all inherit. Well, that's right. We share so, in Christ's inheritance. Well, we're the bride of Christ in that we are married and come under the authority of Jesus well, this Christ. This is what I'm saying. The typologies don't have physical correspondence to necessarily, reality yeah. necessarily because, because they overlap. Yeah. Two things can't be simultaneously true at the same time. So that, that you see what I'm saying? Physically sure. true. Again, yeah. it can't be tangibly real. Anyways, they're just types. They're just symbols. Mm-hmm. Uh, the so, anyways, so that's how the symbology is essentially laid out in scripture. So anyways, so the point to come back to is that if hypothetically, hypothetically, uh, God wanted to have a person symbolically represent, let's say it's Mary, the church as a typological symbol of the church. Okay, that's... Okay, I'm, I'm okay. Sure, I'm, I I I don't see anything inherently wrong with that. However, it doesn't lead to worship at all. It just becomes a symbol. Yeah. So, so it can't lead to worship. It just becomes oh, Mary is the symbol of the church. And if you, then when you see Mary, like oh, you're the symbol of the church. That you see her as the symbol of the church. When in heaven come judgment day, if you ever see Mary, it's, she's the symbol of the church. That's cool. That's not the same thing as an object of worship or an object, right? It's just not the same thing. So. My long-winded explanation is, is that, is it hypothetically possible? Sure, but not to the same extent in which we have it, in which we worship, a, 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 like, in which you they pledge never allegiance to a to queen. Worship, yeah. yeah, you don't pledge allegiance to the queen. You pledge allegiance to the king. And then below that, the king says, hey, uh, do you see what I'm saying there? It's so, uh, maybe no, a because, weird choice yeah, of language. It's but, a weird choice of language because, like, if if we're one for one equating it with, with like, that there isn't a separation. Like if we're one for one equating it with, for example, like the kings of Israel, they did have the role of queen mother. So, so pledging allegiance to the king was the same thing well, as pledging yes, allegiance well, to the, the queen because so, they're not yes, in competition. Is, no, no, I know. But, but well, if you pledge allegiance to the king, you're also agreeing with everything the king owns, the, everything the king has. So yes, of course, that, that's inclusive. Because if you pledge allegiance, to, right, you see what I'm saying? You pledge allegiance, yeah, but, when you have faith in God, you you have faith in everything God has, everything he owns, everything he intends to do. Right. right? I just feel like, I feel like so, we have to kind of go back because I feel, there's just been so much that's been, that's like there, that at the end of the day, we don't know if God has elevated Mary to a, a position in heaven. And that's his choice. If, right. if he has wanted to do that, Great, awesome, but there isn't a hint of that in the New Testament. I mean, you you could argue that there is, and you can make an you can make a case for it, but there's not like a clear cut case for it. Definitely, what you're saying is accurate. Where it's like it doesn't, even if it were true, and we knew for sure that she was a queen, she was given the title Queen of Heaven. Right, doesn't mean that we should worship her. Right, right. Um, there warrants no basis to even because there needs to be our our expressions of worship need to be so clean cut towards God. Yeah. They need to be like, there needs to be a holy chasm between how we honor people 
Agreed. and how we worship God. There needs to be a yeah. chasm. There can't Agreed. be any blurring of lines. Otherwise, it confuses people. Yeah. And we don't want to, right? We don't want to have bad witness and create confusion within the community of Christ. Agreed. So, yes. But we we have a clear picture yeah. of what's going on in heaven right now where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. <laughs> yes. They together are the King of Kings and the yes. Lord of Lords. And that's all that we're we're privy to know. I mean, even when you when you think about like James and John getting their mom to ask Jesus to sit at his right hand, he's like, it's not for me to give. So yeah, you yes. don't know what you're asking. So, 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 right. It's not for me to give it. it that's all going to be worked out with God, like with God the Father. It's all going to be, he's got a plan. And uh, so, so we just got to be careful. So that's what I was saying, because specifically, Paul says that the two become one flesh is a great mystery. Yeah. The whole point of our salvation and what it, it's, it's uh, you know, some of the Orthodox call it theosis, we call it glorification. The whole point of that, or becoming, becoming the adopted sons and daughters of God, is mystery. Mm -hmm. And what that looks like to be, right? What yeah. that looks like is, like, we don't know. We can't mm -hmm. fathom that concept. So um, that is connected inherently to this idea of, ti of titleship and what that and what that implies to be, quote, unquote, someone, if, if someone is a queen of heaven, if Mary is the queen of heaven. So anyways, regardless of that, though, um, it, to me, these are all symbols and they're typological. I don't think we can make it more than that there can't be any instance where you you worship a queen in the same way you worship a king and in the and it's with god there can't be there can't be so inherently there's a, there's a problem there is it you see what i'm saying there's a there's a problem there because if you then say that she is the queen of heaven type, right even though it's typological it's e it's almost equal in authority it's 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 a little it's, it becomes really. weird. the king is equal the king is the highest authority right and you pledge and all of your authority and everything you do belongs to the king. Like you are the king. So this is the idea. Right. So then once you have a title that is mixed in there, this is what I'm saying the difficulty is. The difficulty with saying Mary's queen of heaven. Because mm -hmm. then you have king, queen, right? And if you want to say that, but then again, again, we're princes in a sense and princesses in a sense because we're, we're going to be crowned with glory. It's all, okay. It's all interconnected. So we're going to see what happens. I'm just trying to play a hypothetical game. You look at me like it's... <laughs> no, right. no, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, to, I'm, I'm trying I don't, to... I don't see the point where I'm like, because there's we can't well, know. Well, well, right. Hold on, but hold on. Yeah, of course. That's what we believe. Yeah. Catholics believe that they do know. because Because, yeah. right, the magisterium is laid out. This is the Holy Spirit said this. Mm -hmm. so, so we're just saying what we feel like, according to Catholic Catholicism. So that's why I'm saying this is an important discussion to... Tweet out. No, I haven't fully explored it. I'm still. I'm right now, currently trying to think in my head how to play this out, how to be as, as charitable as I can to a certain view, and what do what do I hold to? Anyways, so my point is that, um, despite that, is that I think that there's room for it symbolically. Symbolically, I, I think that it becomes troublesome when you start making it like a king of queen like you would see in like a coronation ceremony. I guess visually is what's in my head. Where you have the king on the throne, the queen on her throne right beside. See what I'm saying? It's like visually that's that's just a little anyways, but but perhaps I don't really know because heaven is way more abstract than I could possibly understand. It's it's unfathomable what that really looks like it means. So it's just it just it's just me trying to, you know, work my way through the weeds to try to understand yeah. what this means. So that's what I'm saying. So right. I think it works in a symbolic sense. It really does. That's all I'm saying. I think Mary symbolically is, just like the church symbolically is. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whether well, or not it's actual, it, yeah. Yeah, to do it full justice, like if you really wanted to go down that road, I feel like it would be a whole a whole show just for, focused on Marian theology, which right. With more is, than would be interesting like for sure. One minute prep time before. We start the <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Right. I think we should wrap it up though yeah, for today because we are at our time. Uh, uh, there's a couple things that I want to let you know, let you in on. Uh, and the first is that Malik and I are going to be pushing ahead and taping some of the shows in advance. So if you are looking uh 
If you could, for me, look ahead to the New Testament and please let us know in the comment section if you have any questions that you would like us to answer on upcoming shows in the New Testament. This is because I am actually expecting our fourth child. And so I'm going to be taking some maternity leave come late November. Uh, and so we need to be taping ahead to get those a lot of those New Testament programs done so that we still have weekend shows for you guys to do. So, uh, Please, please do that. Uh, also, if you're still here, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, because me and Matt Luck love going through the comment section and talking, uh, going back and forth with you, but also getting your questions. because I, I think it's so interesting. Everyone sees things a little bit differently. And um, I really appreciate a lot of your comments because you come at it from a different point of view than Matt Luck or I, and that's really, really valuable. So thank you so much for doing that. I think that's it. Did I miss anything? No, I think for, it's it. For closing Ask comments. Ask questions, subscribe. New Testament comments. Yeah, I said all that. Okay, We're awesome. <laughs> all right, guys, I hope you have a great week. And until next time, happy reading and studying.